back start. He was roughed up at Florida last weekend. And on the first pitch here tonight, he hits Amani Larry. Yeah, Larry's right on top of the plate on that ball. And he stays in there. Of course, he's got some padding on, I believe. But he stays in there and is able to get hit by pitch. For the Bulldogs, the shortstop number three. Dave Tanner Jones, a hard thrower, a transfer from Jacksonville State, originally from Thornsby, Alabama. But roughed up in his start last weekend in Gainesville. Needs an effective start tonight. Needs to get some distance into this game. But he hit the first batter to the plate in Amani Larry. And now it is David Marchand, the shortstop for the Mississippi State Bulldogs, in from the left side. Low and in on the 0-1, so it evens the count. Yeah, and David Mershon is just one of those guys you love to have on your team or at your school if you're a state fan or, or player. He certainly is a, a guy that's very scrappy. He's going to give it all every single at-bat in every single game. A check of Amani Larry over at first base. I had the pleasure of talking to David before the game, and I just said, man, I love the way you play. He's got the hair flowing out the back, and He's got all the tools in the toolbox there you see in his back pocket. Yeah, guys like us, uh, we're jealous of that <laughs> David Mershon flow coming out of the back of the batter's helmet. He's definitely on the, uh, the all lettuce team coming out of the gate <laughs> of the SEC. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep monitoring that for us throughout the year. Okay. Pick out the best ones. Tanner Jones, that's what he needed. Comes back to strike out David Marchand after he hit the first batter of the inning. Yeah, and you see here David Marchand, he's got two strikes. He's trying to hang on. Looks like a downward moving changeup. Great pitch, and he gets the swing and miss for the first out for the Aggies. And now Dakota Jordan. 11 homers and 35 RBIs. And he's fouled the first pitch away to the right side. He yeah, also had the chance to get to speak to Dakota, too, just a great young man. And I said, what do you want people to know about you? And he said, look, I just love having fun playing baseball. You can see in the way he plays. And we talked about his success thus far, but he was very humble. But, you know, we have Grahovac on the A&M side. This guy is also very powerful. I mean, he just has a lot of tools for sure. He's a strong person. The 0-1. That's a call strike on the outside corner with a breaking ball. And after hitting a man with the first pitch of the game, Tanner Jones trying to settle in. He struck out Mershon, and he's 0-2 to Dakota Jordan. Jordan's definitely a tool guy, definitely a pro prospect kind of a guy. He can really do it all. He can hit, throw, and run. He's got pop. Wow, back up the middle on a two-strike pitch. He reached out and really managed to get that back up the middle. It's a base hit. Yeah, you see the strength on display there. He was able to reach out over the plate, like you said, Will, and really just flick it out there, but it got to center field easily. Again, just shows you the power that he has in that bat speed and, and his forearms. He's got a lot of, uh, a lot of pop in that bat. Yeah, that's not usually a pitch that's going to be sent back up the middle. Yeah, and, and sometimes when you see those weekly hit balls like that, they don't make it over the infielder's head, but that one certainly did easily. Hunter Hines in the first pitch, fouled away. Yeah, this state lineup, I like it a lot. I mean, you've got Mershon, who, again, just a scrappy player. And you go into Dakota Jordan, who's the tools guy and the power guy. And the same thing with Hunter Hines. Again, we talked about him in the opener, just a great career thus far. And he's been hot in the last week as well. Fouled that back, and it's an 0-2 count to Hines with the shift on to the right side for him. Hines, the four home runs in the last two weekends, has him at 43, fourth among active SEC players. Third is the Aggie right fielder, Braden Montgomery. That's a base hit to right field. Montgomery will come up firing toward home plate. Everybody's going to move up a bag. And Mississippi State has loaded the bases with one down in the top of the first. And that lead 
that leadoff batter getting on such a big thing for State. And there you see Hines, he's able to just take that fastball on the inside of the plate, not do too much with it. He stays inside the ball and within himself and is able to get it into right field for a hit. Nice job by Montgomery there getting the ball in low. An early opportunity for the Bulldogs with Connor Hyzak, the center fielder, stepping in from the right side. A hit batter and two singles have loaded them up. And Tanner has the changeup working pretty good here. We'll see if he goes back to trying to get Hyzak out of there. So Hyzak a swing and a miss. Now Jones had Jordan and Hines both behind in the count. But they both managed base hits off of him. 1-1. One, one. That's popped up, and that is shallow in left field. A run won't score on this. Holly Camarillo, the Aggie shortstop, will take care of it. Two down, Tanner Jones, an out away from stranding them loaded. So this is a very early moment that might matter still late in this ball game in the top of the first with the bases loaded two out situation. Oh, you're exactly right. It absolutely will matter. I mean, these are the type of situations which either win you games or lose your lose your games, depending on which side of the coin you're on. If you're Tanner Jones here, you're going to go right at him and try to get out of it with two. If you're Aaron Downs, you're trying to put the ball and play hard up the middle or the other way to drive in a couple runs for state. So the Bulldogs will call on the left fielder Aaron Downs to drive home one or two. And the first pitch to him, low and away, 1-0. You know, again, when you get two outs, runners on, you're really looking up the middle of the field. You want to drive something hard through the box. Came with a strike there on the inner half, evens the count. So some high leverage pitches for Tanner Jones in this first inning but he's trying to strand the bases loaded with Bulldogs at the 1-1. One -one. That's chopped, it'll go foul, it's one and two. You know, Will, that, that was an infield fly a second ago, even though it was in the outfield grass, because uh, Ollie was out underneath it fully, and I saw the second base umpire call for the infield fly. But on a south wind day, that ball's gonna push far. That was a big league pop-up. And it's amazing with the north wind blowing in, it potentially keeps a run off the board for State. Tanner Jones ready to go with a one-two. Just got enough of that, did Downs to foul it off. That was almost a check swing. And it's like he just put the end of the bat on the ball to stay alive. Exactly. But back to that pop fly. We've seen some pop flies here on South Winds that carry forever. But again, you've got the North Wind blowing in here today, and they brought it right back into the infield. Last night there was some weather, and then a cold front blew in overnight. So the North Wind is with us here today. Swing and a miss by Aaron Downs and Tampa. Gavin Grovac, the freshman, the offensive hero last night for the Aggies. In the bottom of the first, he led off with a homer in the fifth inning. He broke a 2-2 tie, and he nearly broke the scoreboard. Hit it over the scoreboard, his grand slam in the fifth. Had it hit the scoreboard, something was going to shatter. <laughs> Couldn't even get a read on the distance, correct? Yeah. Everybody uses that track man system that tells you exit velocity and how far a ball flew. But once it went back behind the scoreboard, you couldn't get a readout on it anymore. <laughs> the system was blocked. Well, we've talked about this before, Will, but his physique's very much like Mike Trout. Just the way he walks around, the way he looks. I mean, he's 220 pounds, you know, six foot two. He's solid for sure. But, you know, this coaching staff talks about his mental approach, too, is super strong and much more advanced than your typical freshman. So he's just got skills that are beyond his years for sure. A great player. And we see that here with two strikes. He's a very patient hitter, even with two. So, again, he looks experienced. He looks like he's just grown up, you know, and made for this. And there's really nothing about him that says freshman. And he has a 2-2 count right here after that foul ball. He's on a seven-game hit streak is Gavin Grohovac. 
And we've seen this time and time again. Will, he, he will foul balls off with two strikes. He'll go the other way um, in foul territory, let the ball travel, get deep, and foul it off to the right side. And then you'll see him, you know, really smoke a ball even with two because he shortens up, but he's so powerful he's able to do that. That's something about the Southeastern Conference and these elite hitters that you'll see in the league, John. Two strikes never seem to bother them. No, and these days with tournament ball at such a young age, these guys are so seasoned, and all these guys play against each other for sure. They're the elite players, and they know each other's tendencies. Grohovac opposite field. This is deep to right on the track, making the catch is Dakota Jordan. But you, if you're an A&M fan there, and you see Cal Steven on the mound. That's a seven pitch at bat. It's a well hit ball. He gets under it a little bit. But again, that's a great at bat if you're a Texas A&M fan. And I'm sure the coaching staff's pleased as well as Jace comes in. There was one point last night in which the Mississippi State starter, Evan Sierra, retired 12 Aggies in a row. It actually came after Gavin Grohovac launched his bottom of the first homer. But there were a lot of well struck balls for the Aggies while they were continually retired. Well, that's exactly right. And tip your cat to Sierra, he did a very nice job. He settled in well and gave State what they needed in yesterday's game. Jay Slavulet hit it right into the shift. I mean, this is kind of what I'm talking about. I mean, that's a laser. He ripped that on one hop, but Amani Larry flashing some leather with a terrific play. Yeah, you see here, Jace put a nice movement on the baseball, and then Larry is right there the shift in the right field and he throws out Laviolette at first base. Nice play there. So sometimes they don't fall and for a while they weren't for the Aggies an evening ago yet. And then today you start with a opposite field fly ball to the warning track and a laser one hopper and neither of them a base hit. Braden Montgomery shift stays on to the right side for him. And the big question for State today with Cal Stevens going to be what are his off speed pitches like? He's throwing 93 to 95, but the Aggies can handle that. So if, he, if he's able to command some of his off speed, he could have a good outing. And if not, it's going to be tough because these guys can hit a fastball at this level without a doubt. But Cal Stevens, 6'4", 215. He's got some nice tilts on the ball. You see Braden Montgomery here. It's this ball and fouls it right off his calf. That's that hurts. Shin. Yeah, shin and calf. Ooh. That hurts bad. And again, that's why a lot of those guys wear those guard. But that's not going to go away, guys, for several weeks. You know, if you never played the game, when you got somebody like Steven throwing at 94, you hit it off the bat at, at 105 straight into your calf. He will be playing with that for a good week or two. And that has him down in the count one and two. Braden Montgomery looking out at Cal Steven. Steven trying to end the inning and go three up, three down on the Aggies. But Montgomery has a hit in all but three games this season. Caught the inside corner. He backed Montgomery off the plate and he painted the corner and he struck him out looking. Nice pitch by Cal Steven. These last two seasons, Mississippi State has missed the SEC tournament, and they started off three and four this year, but they have gotten hot. The Bulldogs have won 13 of their last 16, and they started SEC play last weekend by taking two of three from LSU at Duty Noble Field at their home. And Logan Kohler leads it off in the top of two. The Bulldogs strand of the base is loaded in the top of one. Shift on to the right side. This will be played by the shortstop, Ali Camarillo, who moved to the other side of second base. And he'll throw out Logan Kohler. A better start to the inning for Tanner Jones here in Texas A&M. He goes right at the first hitter there, Logan Kohler, and induces that ground out. So better start for sure if you're an Aggie fan. I've already seen a lot of shifting. You a fan of that? It's been a part of college baseball the last couple of years now. 
I'm not, but nobody cares what I think about it, Will. <laughs> I do. <laughs> That's outside to Bryce Chance. I'll listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really pleased with how Tanner Jones has started this game. Again, rough start there in the first inning, but he's battled back here and is coming right at him in the second. And he's got chance to pop up to the right side of the infield and Ted Burton calling for it. The Aggie first baseman will take care of that. So Tanner Jones a chance to have a much smoother second inning than he did in the first. And again with that wind here it's so weird because the north wind holds it up but it's not as bad as the south wind. The south wind really really pushes the ball towards left and left center and the north will hold it up but it won't, won't really push it back. And you see there on that play by Ted Burton, he just stayed under it the whole time. Johnny Long is the Bulldogs catcher, and it's a call strike to start his count. Long hitting ninth tonight, so you go to the top of the order, and Amani Larry next. That's a way. And a 1-1 count. That fastball for Tanner Jones ran it in there at 94 on that pitch. He can get a touch over 95 on some occasions, and that's low for a ball two and one. Yeah, he's throwing that slider or cutter pretty hard. He, that one's at 88 miles an hour. I've seen a couple of them at 89. So not a huge difference between his regular fastball and what he's taken off there and get a little cut action on it. That's a nice pitch. Low in the zone, and it creates a 2-2 count. Yeah, you see that one, just the traditional fastball there. He's just grabbing it and go, 94. Nice pitch. He's trying to work a little quicker. Reached out, and that will allow Johnny Long to stay alive. Fouled it off over the Bulldog dugout. As a hitter, I would actually prefer that. The guy that's still throwing hard, even with his cutter or his slider, it's not as much of a discrepancy from a mile-per-hour perspective, you know, fastball to slider. So... As a hitter, I actually liked that. It seemed to me that that was a little bit easier to read when it was coming that hard. 2-2 two -two pitch will just miss. Yeah, that looked good from here. Fastball was a little up. So you go full to Johnny Long. And then he just missed the corner. Full count walk. And he'll have to face the top of the order. A look at that last pitch. And just off the plate. Yeah, I think that's a good call. That ball's outside. You see there in that scenario, you've got Jackson Appel set up there inside, and the ball's on the outside part of the plate. It's going to be tough to get that call. Amani Larry, his first time up, didn't see a bunch of Tanner Jones because the first pitch hit him. And he was a base runner immediately. Now, do you like the arm pad and the leg pad? Craig Biggio style. <laughs> I'm fine with it. That, that is in fair territory. High chopper. And Ted Burton has to turn all the way around and throw to his pitcher, Tanner Jones. Jones reaches out. Florida last weekend, he picked up his 100th victory as the A&M head man. And Jackson Appel steps in to start this inning, and Appel has been absolutely scorching hot as of late. Trying to stay that way, and it's a fair ball down the line and right. Jackson Appel, seven for his last 13, and he's got a stand-up double to start the bottom of two. Here we see the approach. Jackson Appel gets the barrel out, gets in front of that fastball, drives it down the first base line, and easily makes it into second base for a stand-up double. And that's what we talked a little bit at the opener with Cal Steven. It doesn't really matter how hard you throw it in there. If there's not respect for that off-speed pitch, it's going to be difficult to get outs consistently in this league. Teddy Burton, he's hit this hard. That's deep to right field. And on the track is Dakota Jordan. He'll make the catch. 
Jackson Appel tags and he goes to third. That's the second time Dakota Jordan has get, had to get back to the warning track in right field to make a catch. That was ripped off the bat of Ted Burton. And you see Grohovac hit the ball well, although he popped it up, he still hit it well. Jason Laviolette hit it well. And of course you see Burton do a nice job to right center field there. Sometimes the game is cruel when you hit the ball hard. But Burton has been swinging the bat well this weekend. Matter of fact, yesterday, that was a huge at-bat for him in the fifth inning. He led off. You remember he had one of the pitches go behind his head, and he was able to really stay in there and battle. He ended up getting a two-strike hit, which led the Aggies off to the five-run inning that ended with Grohovac's grand slam. That really was the difference last night, what Ted Burton started in the fifth. So Burton hit it deep, flew out. Now it's Hayden shot, the left fielder. Hayden Schott is a Columbia transfer. Came to A&M from the Ivy League. He's trying to score Jackson Appel, who also transferred in from the Ivy League. Appel played at Penn prior to coming down here to Aggieland. Scoot out of the way of it in a 2-1 count. So three and one now to Hayden shot. Well, you've seen some Aggies with some hard hit balls that have ended up as outs, and that's been a part of it for Hayden shot this year. Comes into this game with an average at 289, but I'd tell you he's probably swung the bat better than 289 suggests. I would agree with that. And here, if you're Cal Steven, you've got three two. You've got a hitter that's been struggling a little bit. You really have to smell blood in the water here and try to get a punch out. You got the infield back, so all Hayden Schott needs to do is put the ball in play, and it's a run for Texas A&M. So this is one of those individual battles that we talk about, Will. They compound throughout the game, but it's an important one here early. Came inside on a full count pitch, and he walked him, and the Aggies will have runners at the corners with one down. Yeah, and you can see... State definitely likes to throw the ball on the inside part of the plate with two strikes, and they come in hard. They are not afraid to do that. You know, when you're talking about hitting, you really want to move that sight window that you have with two strikes. You're not trying to be so pull side heavy. You want to really take that off and go up the middle the other way when you got two strikes. And State knows that, which is why they're throwing the ball hard in as Hank Bard comes up to the plate. Check swing and a strike on the first pitch to Hank Bard. Hank Bard's a guy that's been, in my opinion, swinging the bat really well. I see the, the swing looks great year over year, and he's earned his spot as the DH here for the Aggies. And it comes to no surprise to that staff or that team. I think they all believe Hank's a good player. It's just awesome to see a, one of the older guys get rewarded. Now he's producing and he's earned that, but in my opinion, he looks confident up there and is, is ready to go. We'll see what he does here, first and third with one out. It's a breaking ball, called strike. He has Bard down in the count, one and two. We're just talking about sight windows here. If you're Hank Bard, you cannot be looking, you know, from the 375 to the right and right center field down the right field line. You have to take that out of play and really just think up the middle here. Bard last night was 0 for 2, but he did draw a fifth inning walk and was on base when Gavin Grohovac launched his grand slam. Tells you what the coaching staff thinks of him, too. That was a left-on-left -left matchup with the at-bat you're talking about there. Look out in the Aggie dugout. And that was hit hard over toward the A&M dugout. I used to have Jim Schlossnagel went bailing out. Now he's back on the steps saying, <laughs> let's go, Hank. <laughs> Hit it that hard, but in fair territory. <laughs> There's a reading on that one, about 112. <laughs> right at your head, coach. Well, he got him looking. Call strike three, and there's two down. Yeah, Cal Steven, when he gets with two strikes, he's going to rear back and just throw it right down the middle. 
good pitch, confident pitch for Cal. I like that he's using the fastball. Again, we talked about this. If he's able to command his off-speed pitch, all of a sudden that fastball gets even more dangerous. And he's thrown a couple sliders for strikes here. So Cal's doing a nice job competing here with runners on. Aggies will ask Ali Camarillo to drive home a run and stake them to the initial lead. Right on right matchup and the infield shifts to the left side of second base. And that's a call strike to start his count. It was Mississippi State who had their chance in the top of one. They stranded them loaded. And now Cal Steven trying to return the favor. This was a golden opportunity for the Aggies. This frame and A&M will cash in. Camarillo rips that to left field. Jackson Appel scores. Yeah, make note of that there. Because we're only in the second inning, but you got two strikes, two runners on, excuse me, two outs, two runners on. And Ollie's able to step up and get the fastball that he wants. It's on the inside part of the play. He stays super short. All you young hitters, you see how short he is there. He's able to get that head out and shoot it into left field for an RBI. Texas A&M up 1-0. And a whole batch of bubbles Dude. into the air at Blue Pell Park. Into the booth. Yeah, right here into the booth, some of them got. Can't even see anymore, man. <laughs> Blurs the vision a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> Caden Kent started off with a strike from Cal Steven. Now he goes the opposite way into left. Aaron Downs tracking it into foul territory, and he will make the catch as he crosses on to the track. Yeah, yes, there's some odd-looking clouds above us, but we believe the inclement weather stays away for this one. We think we're past all that. The cold front that blew through created a bit of a chill in the air, and as we've already alluded to, the north wind has it blowing in. It's going to be hard to get a ball out of here today, most likely. Chopped, and Caden Kent will stay with it and throw out David Mershon. That starts the top of the third. A very nice play there by Caden. He's having to move to his left, and he gets the in-between hop. He's able to smother it. Falls right in front of him. He bare hands it and throws it over to Ted Burton for the first out. Nice play there by Caden. Always dangerous, Dakota Jordan. He singled his first time up. The Aggies. Probably the team with a little more power in this series. After all, A&M, they tie for third in the SEC with 44 home runs as a team. Mississippi State 13th in the conference with 24 homers. So A&M probably slugs it a little more. But certainly this is the guy that can match what the Aggies do in Dakota Jordan. But Mississippi State, I would think, John, they don't strike out a whole lot in general. They're the team that wants to put the ball in play and make some things happen and move runners around the base paths. Now that's exactly right. As you see that ball inside, moves Dakota off the plate. Yeah, they're going to swing freely. They're going to take on the personality of their head coach. And, you know, he's free and easy there. Of course, they've had a bunch of success with him at the helm, but it's amazing how teams do that. But you're exactly right. They're going to swing it, and they're going to let it fly. And these next two guys, Dakota and the next guy in the order, both have some pop. That's where the power comes from for the Bulldogs, but Tanner Jones may get a big out here in foul territory as Ted Burton will make that catch right in front of the fencing, and there are two down. Yeah, this part of the state order is pesky for sure. Jordan and Hines have definitely got the power, and then Mershon is just a guy that's going to get on base, so it's a pretty potent one, two, three, part of the order. I know they're hitting two, three, four in the order, but uh, those three in a row are tough as the shift gets going here. And Mississippi State, two hits thus far, and they are by Jordan and Hines. Hines singled also in the first inning. Yeah, I was watching Hines at BP today. The ball just jumps off his bat. He's, he's bigger than he looks here on camera. He's, he's a pretty stout guy himself. He's tall, too, so he's got some leverage when he gets the bat going. Of course, all these guys are big. Will, it's amazing the size of them. I'm not sure if people really understand if they walk into a clubhouse at this level. There's some big human beings down there. Some linebackers in those clubhouses. <laughs> Tight ends, <laughs> linebackers. I mean, it really is. It really is the truth. Just overall, 
I think the athleticism of the sport has increased, the size has increased, the speed's increased, and I think there's a lot of factors for that. I think NIL's a factor. I think the reduced round draft is a factor. It's off the end of the bat. But to me, as a fan of college baseball, I love it. I'm really happy that it, the game's going that way, but this league particularly is just littered with pro prospects, and, and these are not guys that are gonna play 10 years in the minor leagues. I'm talking about guys that you're gonna see at the MLB level. You might see some future first-round draft picks down on the field tonight. 100%. I mean, with the talent on both of these rosters. Outside to Hines, so you have a full count with two outs to the Bulldog first baseman. Yeah, with well, Dakota Jordan's going to be a first-round pick, and Bobby Lett's going to be a first-round pick. Montgomery's going to be a first pick. Some say in the future for the Aggies, the top three in that order, they may all oh, at different times will be first-round picks. Without a doubt. That's off the very end of the bat, and that will be no play at all for Gavin Grohovac. Are they saying foul ball at home plate? I don't see how that's a foul ball. That's no, just a cue. The home plate umpire was coming out, and I thought he had waved his hands for a second, but, yeah, it was off the end of the bat, yeah. and it's an infield single. I think he's just taking that baseball out of play, thinking it's cut. That's we'll what he wanted him. to do, get rid of the baseball. Home plate umpire David Savage. So yeah, we, that was just simply off the end of the bat. We've seen some baseballs hit hard today for outs, and then we see a big power guy like Hines cue ball one, and it gets a base hit. That's how baseball goes. And Mississippi State has a base runner. Hard hit by Connor Hyzak, and that is into left field, and there's a couple on with two out in the top of the third. The Bulldogs trying to roll with two. Yeah, you see Connor Hyzak here again, an older guy, senior. He knows how to hit. He's in the 350s, and he takes that little cutter, stays back on it, gets the head out, keeps a nice level swing through the baseball and spanks that ball into left field. Good piece of hitting there. Again, that's a guy hitting fifth in your lineup. He's hitting 355-ish. He's got a couple home runs, 20 RBI. I mean, he's a producing player. Your state, you love those kind of guys. You oh, love them. He keeps the inning alive. Bulldogs still with a chance. As I said, they're trying to roll with two. Aaron Downs at the plate. Downs struck out against Tanner Jones with the bases loaded to end the top of the first inning. Some hard action there in on the hands on Aaron Downs. I think Tanner Jones has pitched him well thus far. 1-1 one, one count here with two outs. Jones will deliver his 50th pitch of this Friday night start. And he's got him to lift this over the infield. Gavin Grohovac on the run coming in. He will make the catch and Mississippi State The legend, Ron Polk, on the Mississippi State radio broadcast tonight. He was the longtime head coach of the Mississippi State Bulldogs. He was the head coach of Team USA for a number of years. And in the summer of 1998, Ron Polk was our good friend John Sheshik's head coach for Team USA. Now tonight, he's just two booths down from you as you both Entered the world of broadcasting, John. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin Grohovac leads off, low and away. But you got to talk to Coach Polk, Ron Polk, before this game. Today. I did. We got to talk, and I've actually seen him twice this year, which is crazy. I saw him at the ABCA, the coaches' convention there in the Dallas area in January. And it was pretty neat to see him again today. I mean, just what a great guy. What a great ambassador for our sport. He loves Mississippi State. And, you know, I told the story about him writing letters when I played on the Team USA. Uh, there was a pitcher from Mississippi State. That's going to get into left field off the bat of Gavin Grohovac, who, by the way, a couple summers ago played on the 18U team for Team USA. Yeah, Gavin Grohovac, he's probably going to get another chance or two to play for that club in the future. But, no, I think it was uh, 
it was neat for me to, to talk to Coach Polk today because like I was saying, when I played on the team, Matt Ginner was a pitcher for State who later went on to pitch in the big leagues. And he told me, he said, you're going to get a letter from Coach Polk on your birthday for, for the rest of, of time. <laughs> and I said, come on, there's no way. He said, no, seriously, he writes a letter to every single player that he's ever coached. And I said, you have got to be kidding me. Well, sure enough, I get a letter every year on my birthday. And then on my anniversary with my wife, Callie, he will write a handwritten note that says, hey, John and Callie, I wish you guys a 21st, happy 21st anniversary. It's just unbelievable, his system. And think about it, he's coached for 50 some odd years. And how many players he's doing that with. And he does it to all of them. I mean, it is really a, a remarkable thing, just the discipline to do that. And they're all handwritten. Now, I told him he wrote some on a typewriter. He didn't like that. He said, no, no, no I don't use a keyboard. He told us he doesn't yeah, have a cell phone. He still does not own a computer. No email, no, no computer. <laughs> He's old school. But he, he did used to type them on an old school typewriter years and years ago. <laughs> but now he hand writes them. It's just an awesome, it's an awesome treat for us to get, for sure. Jay Slavulet, opposite field, left center. Long run for Connor Heizak, but he'll get there, and Gavin Grohovac has to retreat back to first base. Yeah, on what I'll call a normal weather day, that ball's way out of the park. But today with that north wind, it's held in. But again, well hit ball by Jace. That's twice he's hit the ball well. The second base, the first at bat, and there to left center, which also tells me he's in nice rhythm. He's really connected with his swing, and he's able to spray the ball from left, or not spray the ball, to hit it with authority from left center to, to the right side. But back to Coach Polk. It really is a treat to receive those notes. And Callie and I love it. I mean, we look forward to it every year. And I try to write him a note back, and it's crazy. I only have to write two a year, and it's hard for me to do. <laughs> this guy's writing thousands of letters every year, and he pulls it off. And, it, you know, his postage timing is, is just incredible. It's, it's on point. Braden Montgomery bats. And Ron Polk, one of the legendary figures in college baseball. The old one. Hit that hard, but that's at the left fielder now going back and on the run making the catch is Aaron Downs and Gavin Grohovac has to retreat again. Yeah, if you're state, you're holding on saying thank you for these gifts. But credit their defense, too. They're in the right spot. And these coaches study all these. They, they study the spray charts. They, they know where guys' tendencies are. But that was a nice play there in left field. But again, the Aggies are hitting the ball well. And that theme has been consistent. We knew they were going to be able to hit Cal Stevens fastball. And they have done that tonight as Jackson Appel comes in, coming off a double of his own. This is a guy that's been swinging it well. Squared around, but pulled back. And the pitch is a strike, so 0-1. We have not seen Texas A&M do much of that. It's really not a part of their game, Jim Schlossnagel. He does not employ the bunt, the sacrifice bunt. Hardly at all. Trying to get over to it right out in front of the mound. And oh, making an odd catch. Barely hanging on as Logan. The finale on Sunday on the SEC Network. Well, both these Aggies and Bulldogs could give quite a good scouting report on that series. Because the Bulldogs opened with LSU at Duty Noble last weekend. A&M went to Gainesville and opened with Florida to start SEC play. They've seen Caglione and White firsthand, haven't they? Man, those two guys can play. Two of the biggest names in our sport today. Both of them just awesome players. 1-1 one, one to Logan Kohler. He's hit that pretty well in the gap. Right center. On to the track. Braden Montgomery will make the catch. We've seen some fly balls deep, but that wind is blowing in. And Kohler tagged that, but he's an out. Yeah, that was a nice job of hitting there by Kohler. I think that ball gets out of the yard for sure as well. You can see it really wasn't that close when it's all said and done. I mean, it's just approaching the warning track, but you really have to poke one today. Now, if you get it down the right field line, you can get some action going there, get a little bit of carry as that wind kind of cuts across. But if it's going to center field or left field or, or any of the gaps, it's going to be tough to get it moving. So we'll see strike one there. Bryce Chance at the plate. He popped up earlier. I'll tell you what else about that LSU Florida series that starts tonight. And we have it for you on the SEC Network on Sunday. That is a rematch of last year's College World Series finals. Yeah, what a bizarre College World Series final it was with Florida just dominating game, game two, two to there. even the series. I mean, they just 
absolutely dominating the next day. LSU does the same thing in reverse. It wasn't quite as bad in the, in the final game, but two lopsided games there in game two and game three. The Tigers took the title. The Gators the runner up. Check swing on a one two. And Bryce Chance did not go around. They appealed at first base to confirm it. We will take another look at it. I think he did hold up. That's very he, close. Yeah, I think he held up as well. It definitely looked different in real time than he did on the replay video, but I do think he held up. It's a good call. Now he's chopped it at Ali Camarillo. Camarillo so smooth. And I say that this time. Burton had to reach for it at first base, but it is a six to three bounce out by Bryce Chance. You see Ali Camarillo there as we go to the replay. You're going to watch what he does again. If you're a young player, check this out. He's, he comes up on the ball and he creates the short hop. You never want to get that ball in between. You'll take the big hop or the short hop, but the one in between with top spin is the one that gets you. You know, we, we talked about fungos and hitting ground balls. They use machines now before the game as opposed to coaches hitting. Camarillo going to get another chance. He has to back to hand this and make the long throw. And well, he made that look nice. Comes later, driven home by Ollie Camarillo. That's the only run of the ball game. As we go to the bottom of the fourth inning, Ted Burton leading it off the Michigan transfer. He has certainly made his presence felt in his first year at AM. He was really good as a Wolverine, too, in the maze and blue. 31 homers in three years in Ann Arbor. Yeah, we're going to see Ted have some power here for Texas A&M, too. He just, he just has too much of it. And you're seeing him drive the ball to right field today the way he did. It wouldn't shock me at all to see some of that power on display. Maybe not tonight because of the north wind, but I think the home runs are coming for Ted. He got into a string at Michigan where he was ripping doubles. I mean, he was a machine for the Wolverines at the two base hit for a while. And he earned the nickname Teddy Two Bags when he was doing that. And you want to see him hit a lot of doubles here just because that's such a cool nickname. That's one bag right there for Ted Burton. Teddy Tubag stays on that nicely. Again, you just see that swing. It's very compact. He's able to get that front foot down and really have a stiff front side and drive that ball up the middle. So we've seen two at-bats from Ted today. One, he drives the ball to right field, doesn't have anything to show for it, but a well-hit ball. And then with two strikes, drives it up the middle. So again, these are indicators of what Ted's swing looks like right now, which is solid. And you will see those power numbers come through for him as time moves on. As Hayden Shot steps into the dish. Hayden Schott is a guy that prior to this weekend might have been on your all lettuce team. He got it trimmed. He trimmed up. He's gone shorter. So Hayden Schott, he grew up in California. And he said for most of the season, when the locks were flowing out of the back of the hat, he looked like the surfer boy that he used to be. Now, after California, he went to military school in Culver, Indiana. He said, this is more of the current look. The shortened hair. <laughs> so He went corporate on us, man. He did. He went back to the military school roots, and he ditched the surfer boy from California. <laughs> he needs to get on the horn with Mershon and figure out how to get that flow back. Get back on your team. I tell you, Mershon's got all SEC flow work in there. You can see it from short. Does he not? Look at that. I mean, you can see him in the bottom right of the screen. I mean, it's almost covering up his name. Shot goes opposite field, and Aaron Downs will make the catch. Aggie's got a lead single, but now one out. Let off the last inning with a single, but Gavin Drahovac was eventually stranded at first base. A&M tried to move Ted Burton around. And as Hank steps in here, Will, just want to talk a little bit about last night. Again, that fifth inning. The big moment, you've got Nolan Stevens, you know, State's impressive freshman that is coming into pitch, and coaching staff leaves Hank Bard in there on a left-on-left -left situation, and I think Hank ended up walking, if I remember correctly. And that really tells you a lot about... Now 
Now they give it back to Cal Steven. And that's off the bat of Hank Bard. They get one out. They're trying to get two. Not in time to get Bard running at first base. It's a nice job by Imani Larry there. That ball's not hit well. So he's able to make the sure out there with David Mershon at second base. Not able to turn it. Would have been a tough 4-6-3 turn, but a nice play by State. Camarillo with the fan favorite from a song perspective here. <laughs> uh, Camarillo's from Chula Vista, California, which is just south of San Diego and just north of the U.S.-Mexico border. The student section loves it. A little mariachi band sends him to the plate. Ripped a single to left that produced the only run of this game back in the second inning. A very nice job there by catcher Johnny Long for State. Again, the way these catchers move today, especially coming off one knee, I, I can't even figure out how they're able to do that so quickly. I didn't see if Johnny was on one knee before that pitch, but, man, even with runners on, I see these guys on one knee sometimes now. Caught the inside corner, 2-1 to Ali Camarillo. Yeah, he wasn't on one knee there, so maybe he wasn't that pitch before, but nonetheless, a great block. Really swiveled his hips, got outside, and just smothered that baseball, which is a huge advantage if you have a catcher that can do that. And we talk about the 90-foot game a lot. And when you have a catcher that can block the baseball, that helps prevent that other team from getting that extra 90 feet. And we know that those things add up. It's almost like turnovers in football. If you can win the 90-foot game, you got a great chance to win the baseball game. And them Aggies certainly keep count of that. That'll be a force out at second base. That will end the inning. We are through. And I am going to give you one other score that might be of interest to a lot of folks watching tonight. NCAA basketball tournament round one at halftime. Texas A&M leads Nebraska 58 to 44. Amani Larry is going to lead off. Well, we haven't heard you call any basketball plays tonight, Will, so we're good, man. <laughs> A lot of Aggies have an eye on the game in Memphis tonight. A&M and the Huskers. One, two count to Amani Larry. Lead off hitter for the entire lineup, leads off the fifth, and he stays alive. And again, you see Tanner Jones continuously coming back to that pitch that it's not, it's not quite a true slider. It's got nice break to it, but it's pretty hard. And that pitch has been effective all night. Now as we see Amani Larry come up for the third time, we'll, we'll see what happens as Tanner tries to make that pass through the state lineup yet again. He's been very effective tonight, though. Well, that's the second time he's hit Amani Larry. And both times it starts an inning. With the first pitch of the game in the top of one, Tanner Jones hit Amani Larry. Now he hits him to start the fifth. Yeah, and if you're state, I mean, that's exactly what Amani Larry's there for. I mean, you don't wish him to get hurt by hit by pitch, but he's done it twice. Now he stands up very close to the plate. That's a two-strike hit by pitch as well, which if you're an A&M fan is, is frustrating. If you're a state fan, it's a gift. And now you have the left-handed hitter, Mershon, coming up with that four-hole open. It's a big shift. So Tanner Jones has walked one Bulldog and also hit Amani Larry twice. And that's why coaches put their lineups together the way they do. You have a guy that gets on base as a leadoff and opens up that four hole for a left-handed hitter. That just changes your whole offense. And 2-0 and now to David Mershon. And you'll see the Aggie bullpen start to stir here. Coach Las Nagel is 
definitely not afraid to get the bullpen going early, and they've got a couple of really strong arms down there that they'll bring in the game. They can give you multiple innings if need be. Well, the Bulldogs told you they make contact. In general, they don't strike out a whole lot, but with Ryan Prager dominating last night and Evan Oshenbeck doing what he does out of the bullpen, even Josh Stewart got a couple big Ks. Mississippi State did strike out 12 times last night, but this is kind of more their form. Only two Ks here tonight by Tanner Jones. They are putting the ball in play, and they'll even take some base runners when you're going to allow Amani Larry to get hit by a pitch a couple times. Correct. Yeah, and of course, last night they struck out four times in the first inning. <laughs> That's right. Ryan Prager had to go get an extra one because one of the strikeouts had a wild pitch attached to it and allowed... It was Dakota Jordan to run. And well, before the game, we talked a little bit about the hold game, just the disruption of timing that these pitchers are all trained on. Every detail of the game is taken into consideration. So you're going to see these pitchers with different hold times on both sides. We want to make sure they keep that run game at bay. Under the bat of David Marchand. And it's two and two now after that breaking ball. And that swing looked very similar to Mershon, I believe his first at bat where he swung and missed. But he has a tendency to get out in front on that off speed pitch. Let's see if Tanner goes back to it here. Goes the opposite way. That's toward the AM bullpen. And he did go back to the off-speed there. That ball coming in at 83 miles an hour. So he's got him out on his front foot now. With a setting sun splashing upon it, a northbound train rolls by behind right field at Olsen Field at Bluebell Park. Two and two. That's fouled away. So extended at bat for Mershon, and now it becomes a situation of who gives in first, who flinches first, Tanner Jones or David Mershon. Yeah, I guarantee you Mershon's not going to flinch. That doesn't mean that he's going to get a hit or do something positive for his team, but he is a battler for sure. Yeah, it's really now who can outlast. Exactly. Nobody's flinching. You're right, Jones or Mershon. It's really going to become... Who can outlast the other? That is another two strike foul ball. Marshawn right now, a 364 hitter. This is the first inning where he got that punch out. I believe it was on a changeup at that time. So you got 2 2 here. Let's see if Tanner goes back to it. Ground ball, base hit into right field, and two Bulldogs aboard to start the top of the fifth. And that's exactly what I was talking about there. You have the four hole open. Mershon gets the off speed pitch. He knew it was coming, and he's able to shoot it right through that four hole. Kent's unable to get there. Now, if your first baseman's playing off, I don't know if he gets to that ball either. And he'll try to keep the Bulldogs at bay, but. Mississippi State threatening. And the first pitch to Dakota Jordan in the dirt for a ball, 1 0. There is the 1 0. That's hit into right field on the run. Braden Montgomery makes the grab, hit on a line, and struck pretty well by Dakota Jordan. Yeah, tough luck for Dakota Jordan there. That's a well hit ball in the opposite field. Braden Montgomery makes a great play. We've seen that on both sides tonight. We've seen some well hit balls by the Aggies, and that one was certainly well hit by Dakota and State. It's a big out for Texas A&M there. I mean, you've got runners on first and second with nobody gone, and that completely changes the complexity of this inning. Now left on left matchup with Hunter Hines, who's two for two in this game. Yeah, and as a hitter, when I was facing a lefty, I was a left-handed hitter myself, and to me it always helped because I'd try to 
not do too much. And Hunter Hines has tagged that deep to right field, and he has put the Bulldogs in the lead, three to one. He stays hot. It's his fifth home run, essentially this week. Three to one, Mississippi State leads. Yeah, and again, when you have that left-on-left -left matchup, I mean, credit Hines there. He does a great job of staying back and really driving the ball to right field. But sometimes just uh, when you face a lefty, you don't try to do too much. And that's exactly what Hunter did here. He had some sort of a, a little cut action on that ball. And you see him stay back with his weight on his back foot, and he just has trajectory. The launch angle is awesome on that. Nice job of hitting there by Hines. And you're right, Will. He has been hot. Man, has he been hot this week. Three home runs in the LSU series. Two home runs this weekend in College Station. That's fouled out of play. And Hunter Hines now three for three in this game, two for four last night, five for seven in the series. Yeah, you can see now why he's gotten some of those preseason accolades that he got. The perfect game, All-American candidate, and, you know, really just a great run producer his entire career. After the Hines homer, Connor Hyzak is down in the count 0 2. Well, for AM, that Dakota Jordan out just looms even larger. That was a big out in this inning for the Aggies. Looped into left field, base hit off the bat of Connor Hyzak. The Bulldogs stranded six runners through the first three innings of this game. They don't strand the two that got on earlier. Here in the fifth as Hunter Hines has launched a three-run homer and put Mississippi State up. And Shane Sadeo here is really going to have to collect himself. You made a great point about how he started out so hot and recently he struggled some. You know, this league is not forgiving. And there's certainly nobody going to feel sorry for you out there. So you really have to get your confidence back. And he's got good stuff. He's just got to execute here. He's got to face Aaron Downs. Downs is 0 for 2. And it all starts with that fastball command and getting ahead just like he just did. And that's into center field. That's a base hit. Play at third base, throw by Jace Laviolette, sliding in safely as Connor Isaac, and the Bulldogs are looking for more. It's a great job of base running there by Connor Isaac. He doesn't even have to look at the coach. It's all right out in front of him. He's got Laviolette moving to his right a little bit, and Jace has got a strong arm, arm, but Connor does a great job on the read and gets the third base there. And again, with one out, you're going to take a little bit more of a risk getting a third base compared to if you have zero or, or two outs. There's a cardinal rule in baseball that says do not make the first or third out at third base. And Hyzak knew that and did a nice job of getting over there. Max. Shift to the right side. For Logan Kohler. Three infielders to the right. Of second base. Inside for a ball. Again, if you're Sadeo, sometimes this happens in baseball. I mean, the, the hits just mount up against you. It seems like everything the opposing team does with the bat, it, it hurts you. A double play ball potentially here. Going to get a tag out, and he dropped the ball. You could have gotten a tag out and a throw to first possibly to end the inning. Instead, nobody is out. Another run will score, and it's two more Bulldogs in scoring position. Yeah, an absolutely great job by Logan Kohler there getting to second base. So we see the shift is played perfectly, and Ollie comes up. He has him right there, but there's just too much force, and the ball pops out of his hand, and Jace comes up to make a play at second base. But a great job there by Logan Kohler. Advanced. And then on a ground ball, it looked like A&M could get a tag out and throw out double play. But a dropped ball on the tag by Ali Camarillo allowed another run to score. And now that on second and third after that play for Mississippi State with one out. 
and Bryce Chance at the plate. That is down the line. That's a long run for Braden Montgomery. That will score another run. Five to one. Mississippi State as Aaron Downs comes home on the fly out to right by Bryce Chance. Nice job of hitting there by Bryce Chance. Again, the RBIs are going to be up the middle the other way. Especially when you get a pitcher like Peary throwing against you. He does a very nice job of poking that ball up to right field for the sack fly. This is at Caden Kent. That will end the inning, but nine Bulldogs come order in college baseball, and those numbers would not suggest otherwise. A&M going to have to roll from behind in this one. Call strike to start the count on Caden Kent is Cal Steven. Has only allowed that second inning run, and now he pitches with his team well out front. One thing Ron Polk told me today before the game, Will, was if you're playing AM, you have to get the eight and nine hitters out because of the top three in the order, as you just discussed or described. So this is a big plate appearance for the Aggies and also for State. Caden Kent lifts it to left field, and Aaron Downs will retire him one out. So they do retire the nine hole hitter before getting to the vaunted top of the order. For the Aggies, third baseman, number nine, Gavin Grohovac. Gavin Grohovac is one for two against Cal Steven. We talked a little bit about Nolan Steven. Nolan Stevens, excuse me, last night growing up and knowing Gavin Grohovac. So that must have been an interesting exchange between the two. Yeah, both from California. Known each other, played against each other, and Nolan Stevens told me that Grohovac was texting him last night. I'm sure ribbing him a little bit about giving up the big fly. <laughs> That's pretty cool to see. Again, these players at this level, they know each other before they show up at the collegiate level. Especially with the way these national tournaments are with Perfect Game and other organizations. The elite talent all ends up playing each other. And it really doesn't matter where you're from. If you're an elite player and you're going to be in the SEC, you're going to be going to those national showcase tournaments where these guys get to know each other. And we talked about some of the USA team connections that these guys have. And so they develop relationships even though they're competing hard against one another. 3-0 pitch here. Take sign and a strike, three and one to Gavin Grohovac. One for two, flew out in the first deep, singled in the third. Cal Steven trying to come all the way back to full count now. Mississippi State, five runs on eight hits. A&M a run on four hits. The Aggies have one error, it was costly. See if Cal Steven comes with a fastball in. And this is what we we're talking about earlier, talking to Coach Early, the hitting coach for AM. Your sight window has to change. 3 0, 3 1, or actually 3 1, you're looking to pull hard. And you saw Gavin, he took an outside pitch. Tip your cap to Cal Steven. He threw a fastball in the outer third of the plate, 3 1. Now with 3 2, your sight window has to change. You cannot look dead red pull here. You have to be aware of the opposite field and in up the middle. And we see Gavin just continuously do what he's doing right now. I mean, seemingly every at bat, he's fouling baseballs off with two strikes to the right side. Getting the pitch counts up. Back to what we talked about at the onset, he's just a polished hitter as a freshman. It's a very impressive approach, both mentally and physically, for Gavin. And again, we've seen Steven come in with a fastball and two strikes. That was more middle-middle there, but he, he does, he does want to try to freeze you. Because again, he knows the sight window of the hitter's changing. He knows that they're looking to not yank the ball down the left field line, but they're looking to hit it up the middle of the way. And so to counteract that, he's going to try to bust you in. He's done that effectively a couple times tonight. Another full count pitch coming to Gavin Grohovac. 
And we will get another one. Yeah, this is just like the battle with Mershon. Gavin's the same type of hitter. He is not going to give in. Trying to become a one-out base runner with AM trailing in the bottom of the fifth. And again, it becomes who can outlast the other on these extended at-bats. Well, pitchers don't like this because whether you're throwing in, out, the hitter keeps fouling it off. You're like, man, what do I have to do to get this guy to swing and miss? And all it takes is that tiny little mistake where the pitch gets a little bit too much of the plate and it would be driven hard. <laughs> it just won't quit. Still going Steven against Grahovac. State's performance tonight is taking this crowd out of the game. They're trying to get into it here. They know what's at stake with these three hitters in the Aggie order. This is where they do their damage. <laughs> is that foul ball number six on a full count? Getting hard to keep count. Call strike three. Grahovac thought he had drawn a walk. Cal Steven goes the distance against the Aggie leadoff hitter and strikes him out looking. Cal Steven, after a major battle against an elite hitter, paints the outside corner with a firm fastball and gets the strikeout looking to Gavin Grahovac. Great job by Cal Steven there, and actually by both players. That's just a good battle. Jay Slavulet, 0 for 2 in this game. He was 0 for 4 last night. And an evening ago, Laviolette, for the first time this year, did not reach base in a game. He had reached in all of the first 21 contests for the Aggies. Well, they had the shift on, so this is a long run for everybody. Sliding onto the track. David Mershon with those. Second baseman, number eight, Abani Larry. Bulldogs sent nine men to the plate in the top of the fifth, so it's Amani Larry again to lead off in the top of the sixth. And Larry's been hit by a pitch twice, both times by the Aggie starter, Tanner Jones. in play in fair territory. Braden Montgomery coming on and he'll make the catch. One out. And this is about the time of night where it gets a little tough to see here at Olson Field, Blue Bell Park. We saw that in the Sam Houston game when we were doing the game, Will. It's ball to left field right about now. So it does get that way here for about 10 or 15 minutes each night. Usually it's the opponent that has to deal more with it. And also in this park, there's, if you get a south wind, which we don't have tonight, you always got to be ready for those foul balls that get above the roof here and they can blow back in toward fair territory. It's always something the opponent has to be wary of. Those are my favorite to watch. <laughs> the Aggies know how it works. The opponent, not always. It is somewhat comical when you see the first baseman run all the way over to the dugout or to foul territory there in the ball. I've seen it land fair before. <laughs> David Mershon, after a terrific play to close the fifth, rings a single to center field here in the sixth. He's two for four. Yeah, it sounds like a broken record with Mershon, but he's just a solid player. You're going to have to compete with him hard on every single pitch. And, you know, Coach... Lamonis and I were talking before the game, and he just sung his praises and said he does a great job. Mershon is three for eight in the series. With a man on, now you have to try to get through Dakota Jordan and then Hunter Hines. 
Foul out of play on the first pitch to Jordan. Dakota Jordan one for three, singled his first time up, then a foul out, and then he flew out to right. What an opportunity here for Weston Moss, too. Like you said, he had a outing against the Florida Gators, but as a freshman, he's getting to come in here and get some great experience in an SEC Friday night game. Now, Mershon, one thing you have to consider when he's on base, he's 8 of 8 on his stolen base attempts. Bulldogs like to run, and it's Mershon who's done it the most. And the Aggies are aware of that. And again, Weston Moss doing a nice job on the whole game here. Those coaches are really managing every single facet of the game. Not only are they managing the pitch selection, but they're managing the whole times. They're managing, you know, really every detail these guys are going through out on the field. The game's changed a lot over the years in that aspect. So last night, A&M won at 6-3. The Bulldogs trying to even the series on this Friday night, and the finale is set for tomorrow at 2 o'clock at Bluebell Park. The coveted Saturday day game. Are you a fan of that? I'm a fan of moving some series up to Thursday night because it's more television for college baseball. True. Which I enjoy. Of course. So, I think the SEC did that originally for, for the Easter holiday. Is that correct? Or were, were they trying to? Yeah, most series Easter weekend will get moved up to a Thursday just to avoid Easter. And then the final series of the year is moved up to Thursday to give everybody an extra day of rest before they go to Hoover for the conference tournament. Mm -hmm. If anything else gets moved up to Thursday, a Thursday start, that is due to television. Hovac trying to start a double play, not in time at first base to get Dakota Jordan. Yeah, again, so any young players watching Gavin here, it's exactly what we talked about with Ollie, and we'll check and look at the replay here. Gavin has a chance to see this ball down and quickly comes up and grabs it and creates that short hop. Again, we don't want to get the in-between hop. We don't want the one that's... Uh, not high or not low. It's in between. It's got that top spin on it. And like we said, they have machines out there before the game that, that simulate that top spin. So a human being hitting a fungo is not going to give you the same simulation. Back to the details of the game, the coaches know the percentages of balls that are top spin, that, that are hit with top spin, if you can believe that. And strike one there to Hines. But they actually know on ground balls how many of them typically have top spin and how many of them typically don't. So they simulate that with the machines and they want these players to do exactly what Gavin just did. Go create that short hop for themselves so they can make a nice play. And they'll tell you statistically that most of the ground balls that have considerable top spin are the ones that are at a third baseman. Exactly. Weston Moss trying to get through Hunter Hines and in the inning. It's going to the backstop and going to second base is Dakota Jordan. And that's a 90-foot win there for Dakota Jordan. He does a great job of reading ball. And the, the tricky part on that play is you got to make sure that baseball extends past the catcher because sometimes they'll drop it and it's kind of hard to see. But he read that one really quickly. Of course, he's got good speed and was able to get to second base, but chalked that up for a 90-foot win for State. And a runner in scoring position with the hot-hitting Hunter Hines at the plate. Fouled that off the end of the bat. Big time in the game here for Texas A&M. You're still in the ball game here if you're an Aggie fan. State's arguably their best hitter, their best power hitter. Up, it's a big matchup. Check swing, he didn't go around. They appealed down at third base. Yeah, as we see the replay coming here, we're seeing more and more of this 
Will with every passing game. With two strikes, you kind of see the flinch from Hines there. With two strikes, you're seeing more and more pitchers come in. That was some sort of off-speed or a change-up, but it was still on the inner part of the plate. Full count pitch missed inside. There was a base open with two outs. Yeah, I like that pitch by Moss there. Hines is going to have a tough time keeping that ball fair because it's in off the plate on his hands. Again, following that same rhythm of throwing inside with two strikes. We're seeing that more and more, but I like that pitch. First base is open. You've got State's best powder hitter up. I'd rather take my chances with Hyzak. Out in front, swing and a miss by Hyzak. Hyzak's three for seven in the series. He has a couple singles tonight. I said I'd rather take my chances, and here comes a guy hitting 372, 20 RBIs. <laughs> but still, I think it's the right move. He's out in front of that, too. And he's down in the count. You see, he's really pull happy there. That's why he's so far out in front. We'll see if he changes his approach here. Again, big opportunity for Moss here to get out of this inning. Krahovac got a late jump on it, but that is heading to the outfield in foul territory, and it'll be shot. Dogs, they lead 5-1 to one now as we go to the bottom of the sixth inning. For Hunter Hines, in five SEC games now, he has five home runs. Braden Montgomery's 0 for 2 tonight. He will lead it off at the bottom of six for A&M. For the Aggies, you need base runners. Still time, but the late innings are next. Well, the story of tonight thus far has been Cal Steven. You're right. And I don't think anybody was expecting this kind of outing. Heck, I'm not sure if the state dugout expected this kind of outing especially coming off his outing against LSU. But he has commanded the zone, been aggressive. He's really pitched well. And he's had some fortunate, some fortunate defensive outs, too. The ball's been hit hard numerous times. And again, that's not to take away from his performance. He's done well, but the Aggies have hit the ball well, too. But he has been the story tonight. Said he needed a bounce back start, and he's getting one. Cal Steven last weekend against LSU threw two innings and allowed five hits and five runs. But thus far, five innings against the Aggies, four hits and just the run. See if he comes fastball in here. Well, he did come in, but too far up and in. Yeah, you can definitely see that's the M.O. for this state pitching staff. They've done it for two nights in a row. And, and speaking of that, last night, Jackson Appel, we're talking about changing the sight windows. Jackson Appel, he really got fooled on a fastball in with two strikes last night and took a defensive swing. But I will say this, I think it was a productive at-bat because when you see that from the dugout or from the coaching staff, you know that he's buying into the philosophy. He's going to give up the inside of the plate, which is really a team play. So even though he didn't look great on that swing, it tied him up and it got him inside. You know he wasn't looking pull side. And, and again, that's the philosophy that these coaches are teaching these guys. So when you see that in action, it looks bad. But it's actually a positive thing because Jackson is, is taking the philosophy to the plate. But they continue to pound him in. Pell, the double, and scored the lone run of the game for the Aggies. He's seven for his last 14, but that looks like it could end the inning, or excuse me, the first two outs of the inning. And it does. 4 6 3 double play. Amani Larry to David Mershon to Hunter Hines. They get Montgomery, they get a Pell, two down in the inning. Taylor made double play ball. Nice flip. 
by Monty Larry over to Mershon. Finished off by Hines. Good job by State there. And, you know, baseball's such a game of a small degrees of separation. Mershon hits that ball in the four hole in his half of the inning. And then the four holes open there for, for Jackson Appel, another left-handed hitter. So you have the same scenario. Well hit ball, except this one goes right to the second baseman as opposed to shooting through that four hole. So the Aggies get the lead man on, but he's taken off the base paths rather quickly with the double play ball. So with two outs, Burton hits. Really like where Burton is right now. He's hit the ball hard to right field, hit the ball hard up the middle. His approach seems very confident at the moment. If Mershon, if Mershon's on the all uh, all lettuce team, Teddy's got to have the best nickname. I'm with you on that. Oh yeah, it's a good one. And he has gone for four doubles as an Aggie since arriving at College Station. You're looking to use that more though. Yeah. You you like the nickname? Oh yeah. Burton, I mean, he's listed as Ted Burton on the A&M roster. But when you play baseball, how do you not call him Teddy? Got to be Teddy. He said his middle name is William. Not with an S, but William. <laughs> the Michigan transfer. Really solid collegiate baseball player for sure. Yeah, he draws a walk, two walks this inning, but the double play ball erased one of those. The Yankees are going to try to roll with two. Texas Aggie left fielder number five, Hayden Shot. Cal Steven has thrown five and two thirds innings, but he can get some distance in some games. On the first weekend of the year, he threw seven innings against the Air Force, and he threw six innings twice this year in appearances against Mount St. Mary's and Evansville. So he can go longer, and he's approaching 90 pitches in this one. High in the zone for a strike to Hayden Shot. In the crowd here is looking for something to cheer about. I've heard Coach Schlossnagel talk about that some too. You know, sometimes the play generates the crowd, sometimes the crowd generates the play. It's a good crowd, mostly full at Bluebell Park, but the big fifth inning by the Bulldogs has silenced them. And they're looking for something to roar about. Had the leadoff runner on this inning, but that can get you up, but the double play ball can sit you right back down. That's inside. Two and two to Hayden Shot, trying to become a two out base runner as he has Ted Burton at first base. Yeah, for an offensive club, a double play is just such a killer. It crushes momentum. If you're defensive, on defense when that happens, though, it's very positive for sure. Another well-hit ball. Liner right at David Mershon, and that these are to hang on and win on Sunday. They would play in the second round against the winner of the Houston-Longwood game. Houston, the top seed in that regional, taking on the number 16 seed. Longwood later tonight. Assuming U of H wins, I think that's a good matchup for Texas A&M. They played them earlier in the year in Houston. The Aggies uh, nearly beat the Cougars, and that was without Tyrese Boots Radford. I think sometimes when you're a lower seed, you just play free. You had the pressure of that number one seed on you. A lot of people picking U of H to go to the Final Four. A&M would give them a good game, I believe. Three and one count to Aaron Downs, who starts off the seventh inning for the Bulldogs. 
if you're Weston Moss here, you got to go right at Aaron Downs. And he did, swing and a miss. Actually gets him with the changeup, I think. It was right at him. But interesting that he's able to have that confidence on a 3-1 pitch. I believe that's two in a row, even 3-0, I think he threw one. So let's see what he does here, 3-2. Comes back with it again. So Moss just with total command of that changeup. Also, Mississippi State, their basketball team was in the NCAA tournament this year. They made it to the dance. Lost yesterday to Michigan State in the first round. And Weston Moss strikes out Aaron Downs. That's a really good job of pitching there. Weston Moss gets Aaron Moss to, or excuse me, gets Aaron Downs to speed up his bat with multiple changeups. Then he comes back in with a fastball in, and we've seen that theme on both sides now. He gets the punch out looking. So good, nice job of pitch selection there. Confidence with two strikes and three balls and gets the out. It's just the third strikeout by Aggie pitching tonight. The other two were in the first inning. So it's the first strikeout by an Aggie pitcher since the first inning. And we've said the Bulldogs don't strike out a whole lot. They put the ball in play. And they've done that tonight. And the big frame for them was the five run fifth. Well, now Weston Moss trying to ring a few up, and he gets Logan Kohler. And this is what I love to see when guys get opportunities on the weekend and conference. You see some guys really rise up and just build confidence, and you can start to see that with Moss here. His body language has shifted a little bit. He's just getting the ball and throwing it, trusting his stuff, and it's working out well for him thus far. Also shows you how dominant Prager was last night. This is a tough team to punch out, and... Man, his stuff was electric early on in that game and then had the one inning where he gave up a, a run or two and then he came back strong. So great outing by Prager. And Prager in six and a third last night struck out eight Bulldogs. And then the Bulldogs are returning the favor with what Cal Steven is doing on the mound this evening. Swing and a miss there by Bryce Chance. Steven on the other side of things has thrown six innings. Only allowed the one run to the Aggies back in the second inning. Steven has struck out three Aggies tonight. Uh, Weston Moss has mixed in that sweeper on this at bat, throwing the changeup, throwing 93 94 on the fastball, moving it to both sides of the plate. Really has command of his stuff now. Center field, and Jace Laviolette took that. So he works into the seventh after the stretch is over. And he looks in at Hank Bard. Bard 0 for 2 off Stephen tonight. Tried to go the opposite way with the shift on to the right side. Foul ball. Yeah, I don't think that Cal has come middle middle a lot too. He's been you know, effective inside the zone. Very effective. And I was really questioning how his off speed would do tonight, but he's done just enough in that area. And that's his fourth strikeout. As he gets barred to start the bottom of the seventh. Texas shortstop number two, Now, that was middle middle there. He's just rearing back and grabbing it and go. But my question mark was, how was it going to do, you know, when the Aggie hitters were on the fastball? Well, he's been able to command that fastball so well. Aggie hitters have struggled with it, and I think a ton of that is just because of the location, especially with two strikes. He's thrown the fastball very well with two strikes. And as we've also discussed tonight, Will, Early on in the game, the Aggies really barreled up the ball quite a few times and didn't have a lot to show for it because they just went straight to the state defenders. Ali Camarillo has his second hit of the night. Camarillo drove in the only run of the game for AM in the second inning. Now he singles in the 
bottom of the seventh. He's two for three, both singles. Pinch hitter into the game, and it is the freshman Jack Bell. And the Aggies have, you know, three freshmen that I know they're really high on. Jack Bell is one of them. Got Caden Sorrell and Jet Johnston. I think one of those three guys is going to end up having some pretty meaningful playing time for the Aggies at some point this year. But Jack Bell is certainly one of them that. Uh, I know the AM believes highly in. Last at bat he recorded was March 8th against Rhode Island. Jack Bell, the freshman from Corpus Christi High School, or excuse me, Corpus Christi Ray High School, where he hit 377 as a senior. A low for a ball, and it's 2 0. Oh. And this is Coach Schlossnagel here looking for a spark. Just looking for a spark. Again, you've got that leadoff, or excuse me, you've got a runner on first base. you got the four hole open. Yeah, this place really has been pretty quiet since the three run homer launched by Hunter Hines in the fifth. And it turned into a five run frame for the Bulldogs and the Aggies. Haven't been able to mount a rally since falling behind. And a 2 2 count to Jack Bell. Yeah, and I would have liked to see Jack swing the bat there. He's taken two pitches. Well, he's taken four, but he's taken two strikes there. Now you got a two strike approach. You have to really just come in and let it go. Full count now to Jack Bell. So you just have to breathe deep, slow your heart rate down. Hadn't had an at bat in a while. Don't try to do too much. Just be who you are. And let the game come to you. Hard cut, came up empty. Cal Steven is now over 100 pitches in this one, and he just registered his fifth strikeout. Nothing's changed with Cal Stevens' approach all night long. That's another 3 2 fastball. And he is coming right at these Aggie hitters. And we'll see if Coach Lamonis is done with Cal Steven here as his pitch count is up to 104. What a night for Cal, especially this part of the ball game. With one swing of the back, could really change something. But we'll see what happens here. Yeah, he'll go right on right against Gavin Verhovac. Grohovac's last at bat, he fouled off, I think it was six full count pitches before he struck out looking. And he didn't like that strike call either. He didn't like the one he struck out on earlier. And he didn't like that one. Schulke dropping that arm slot. AM has a base runner and Ollie Camarillo at first. That road in and a one and two count to Gavin Gerhovac. Yeah, Schulke's got that sink action. He's coming from such a low spot there. He really gets that arm side run on that ball big time. And then he'll flip that Frisbee up there going away from the right-handed hitter. Of course, this is why Lamonis put him in the game. The right-on-right -right match up there. It's a tough ask for a hitter, especially from that arm, arm angle. The ball's really starting behind you. And again, it's got that arm side run sometimes, and it's got that Frisbee-style sweeper away. And Grohovac stays with it to stick with a one-two count. So top of the A&M order. I don't know if that was a misread, but the clock said that came in at 67. It was slow for sure. Didn't have a lot on it. 
he changes his arm slot. Yeah, that one says 71, so it's probably right. Yeah, that was over the top there. So seeing a lot of different things. But he's one of those guys that if he throws a fastball in there at 85, it looks like it's 100. Because he lulls you to sleep with the slow stuff and then throws something firm in there and it's on you quick. Again, with that arm side run, it makes it tough. Chopped off his ankle, and Grohovac will hop away from home plate. Yeah, I feel if the slider comes or off speed comes here, I feel like Gavin will be on it. We'll see what happens here on this foul ball. It did hit the ground first, and we saw Braden earlier go straight off the calf muscle. That one won't hurt as bad, badly. Breaking ball, got him swinging and round. Where on Sunday they will face either Houston or Longwood. Houston, the number one seed in the region. Longwood, the number 16 seed. Wade Taylor finished with 25 points and seven three-pointers. Seven of 10 from behind the arc for Wade Taylor in the Aggie basketball first round NCAA tournament win. You know, if the Aggies shoot the three well, they're going to be tough to beat. Well, they can defend and they can rebound. Just got to hit shots in the NCAA tournament. Exactly right. They've got a rebounding machine there. Former Mississippi State, right? Anderson Garcia, you're Man, right. Man, Garcia reminds me of how Rodman used to play. Just didn't even care about scoring. He's just going to pound the glass. True team guys are going to walk here to lead off. You know, West of Moss has pitched really well. I hate to see that leadoff walk there. Yeah, Moss through two innings has held the Bulldog bats down. It's a, it's a quality outing for him thus far if he can hang on to it. And if he could couple this with that scoreless inning he threw last weekend against a really good Florida lineup, it's possible you could see a bigger roll on the back end of this. But that's a base hit through the left side and now Moss is going to have to deal with two Bulldogs aboard with nobody out if he's going to get out of the eighth unscathed. Amani Larry singled his first hit of the night. He's actually reached three times tonight because of that hit and he's also been hit by a pitch twice. Yeah, I know that's Amani Larry's first hit, but he's been on base multiple times as you just said. And he's done a good job as a leadoff hitter of getting on. You're right back into the thick of the lineup here for State. So, you know, again, pivotal, pivotal moment for West Moss and the Aggies here. That's out in front of home plate, and the runners will move up. West and Moss, they'll throw out David Mershon to even things up. And a call strike from Peyton Smith to Dakota Jordan. And Jordan, I think, may have wanted to step out of the box. But he is down in the count, 0-1. Swing and a miss on a breaking ball. Jordan, one for four tonight. Tried to go away again with a breaker. Yeah, Peyton Smith's a rangy guy. He's got some nasty stuff. His delivery, his delivery is a little bit different. He poses challenge for the hitters. You see it there as he gets a punch out on the slider. That's a big out for the Aggies for sure. Nice job there by Smith to get one of State's two best hitters. You'll see it here. He sets it up and that slider goes down and away. And Dakota has no shot on it. Nice job by Smith there. Yeah, you're right in referencing that as a big out. And then he needs to go get another one. If A&M's going to make a comeback, this doesn't need to get any worse. And he struck out a big hitter in Dakota Jordan. But now he's got to get Hunter Hines. Hines has been on base every time he's come up. Single in the first, infield single in the third. Then the biggest swing of this game, 
his three run homer in the fifth and then he walked in the sixth. They'll put him on. Yeah, doesn't like have that. to go get Hines because they'll put him on base. Yeah, especially I mean, you try to get Hines to swing and miss there. They throw a back foot slider on the first pitch and then they go away from him on the second pitch. And then once it gets to two and oh, it's the right call for sure. And again, we talked about this before, but now you have Isaac coming in at 367 with two home runs and 20 RBIs. So it's still a solid hitter that you've got to get out here, but you'll live with it. If Hines, I mean, excuse me, if Isaac beats you, you'll live with it. You just don't want Hines beating you. Isaac two for four in this game, but he skied this toward Jace Laviolette, and that'll end the inning. Bulldogs will strand him loaded. He's 0 for 7 this weekend against Bulldog pitching. But it's only a matter of time for Jace. Again, he's hit the ball well tonight. Not much you can do when that happens. I mean, he could have had a home run on a normal day. Yeah, he's had two line drives in this series that were hit hard that weren't base hits. Now he's going into the gap, but Dakota Jordan will get there. One out in the bottom of the eighth. And that's the tricky thing about baseball. There's nothing wrong with Jace. Just sometimes they fall and sometimes they don't, but that does impact your confidence. And confidence is such a huge thing in baseball. Braden Montgomery, 0 for 2. He's walked. Told you earlier that Montgomery has gotten a hit in every Aggie game except for three. Possibly his last chance here to get a hit. Bulldogs have out hit AM tonight 10 to 5. And this heralded top of the order for AM, Grohovac, Lavulette, and Montgomery only has one of the hits. It was a Grohovac single in the third. And Montgomery pops out to Amani Larry. Only multi hit Aggie tonight is Ollie Camarillo hitting in the eighth spot. Been a terrific job on the mound by the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Cal Steven went six and two third, was excellent. And then Cam Schulke got a strikeout. And now it is Tyler Davis trying to work through a clean bottom of the eighth. Jackson Appel, one for three. He doubled back in the second inning and scored later the only run of the game for AM. Jackson Appel showing bunt there, just trying to get something going for the Aggies with two outs. And AM needs that spark for sure. Went away. That'll make it over to the East Lawn or right above it. And credit the state pitching staff for really controlling the game thus far. Not what I expected to see tonight, especially with AM's offense and how how well it's done thus far this year. Credit State, they've done a nice job. A little bit in and a full count to Jackson Appel. He's trying to become a two-out base runner. AM has not been able to rally since falling behind in the fifth. And Appel to center field, waiting on it is Connor Heizak. Three up, three down in the bottom of the eighth in Mississippi State, three outs away. After the second inning, they have not had a runner reach second base. And 
you almost don't like putting it this way, but having seen A&M all year, it is a terrific offense. Maybe one of the best in the nation. Certainly one of the best in the nation, if not the best. But I would call this one of the most lifeless nights we've seen from the A&M offense this season. And you have to credit the Mississippi State Bulldog pitching staff for what they've done. Cal Steven, Cam Schulke, and Tyler Davis to this point. That's outside to Aaron Downs. Peyton Smith on the mound for AM. Downs tonight, one for four. He has singled and scored a run, and Peyton Smith strikes him out. Yeah, that's a nice pitch. Again, it's got the arm side run on it. We see the replay here. He gets it 3-2. He has that whip action. You see it just dive down and in at 92 miles an hour. It's a tough pitch to hit. Really, if you hit it, it's going to go foul. So it's a plus pitch for Smith there on a full count as Logan Kohler comes up to the dish. Deep on the shift. Jack Bell out there in shallow right will make the play. Now that, that shift is an amazing weapon. I mean, it really does increase your odds as a defensive club there. Bell's out there in right field when he makes that play. A&M has five hits in this game. If you look at their season low totals for a single game, two other times this year they only registered five hits in a game. That was March 6th against Texas Southern and March 9th against Rhode Island. And then on March 1st, in a 4 nothing win over Arizona State, the Aggies had just four hits. So just a tick above their season low tonight with the five base knocks. Been out hit by Mississippi State 10 to 5. Nolan Stevens, who pitched last night, he, you commented on earlier, he now bats. Yeah, curious to see him up at the plate. Two-way guy out of California. He did a good job last night coming back after giving up the home run to Grovick. did a good job on that. I mean, that's a tough spot. You give up a grand slam to grow back and then come back and pitch well for three or four innings after that. Draws a walk here. And if you look out there at the scoreboard, there's actually a whole lot of zeros on it. A&M just the one run. They got it in the second. Mississippi State had the big five run fifth, but other than that, that's it. It's all zeros the rest of the way. A&M has just scored in one inning. Mississippi State has just scored in just one inning. wonder how much that north wind impacts the overall offense, you know, just from a psyche perspective and a mindset perspective. Obviously, it's knocked down some balls tonight that would have gone out of the yard for both clubs. Once you get those visuals on that, it can kind of affect you mm -hmm. on future plate appearances. It shouldn't, but it does. Everybody's human, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I think the error in the fifth was a big play in the ball game too. Yeah, that was a possible double play ball that would have ended the inning with A&M trailing three to one. That'll get into center field off the bat of Johnny Long. Two on, two out in the top of the ninth. Yeah, that there, that is the in-between hop that we've been talking about all night. That's such a tough play because Ollie knows that he's got to get up 
and get to it, but he's not able to create that short hop like we're talking about. You see how it bounces up on him there. It's not the high hop and it's not the short one. It's a really tough play to make. But if you lay back on that baseball, then all the runners are gonna be safe. So I think you have to make that, dec that decision. A little more, they're in search of insurance with Amani Larry coming into the plate, two out, two on. Conversation is over, and Peyton Smith goes back to work, high and tight on the first offering to Larry. Larry has a hit tonight, and he's also been hit by a pitch twice. Caught the outside corner, one and one. Good sequence there by Peyton Smith. He's gone outside with the slider and come back through the front door on the inside part of the play with the slider. Now he's got a one-two count. Again, pivotal part of the game still. And he's Best got, away. He's got that sweeping action. I mean, that 6'4 frame, long arms, kind of an unorthodox delivery. Makes it really tough for right-handed hitters to pick that up. Full count pitch coming to Amani Larry. I'd like to see that arm side run fastball on the inside part of the plate here. That's worked for both sides tonight. I'd like to see it again. And there it was. Absolutely, and a swing and a miss by Amani Larry. Looks to close out the Aggies. Ted Burton will lead it off. Tyler Davis starts him off with a strike. Burton is one for two, and he's also walked. The hit was a single back in the fourth inning. And now, if you're the Aggies, if you're Burton, if you're shot next, you're only thinking base runners. Get on however you can. Doesn't have to be doubles. Don't have to leave the yard. You're just trying to work your way aboard. So Burton trying to start it off. Davis, a 3-1 count to him. And he fouled that off, so full count pitch coming. I was surprised to see a swing there, even though it's a 3-1 count. The Aggies need base runners. He took a hack at it. I credit him for the aggressiveness, but here at A&M, Supporter, you want to see him on base here for sure. And there you Upstairs go. Upstairs, and he walked him. Lead man is aboard. And, Will, we have seen some crazy things happen in this ballpark over the years. You've been a part of the field <laughs> as a player. I have seen some of them firsthand. I believe it was your junior year, 1998. AM trailed Rice nine to nothing in the late innings. That's correct. And you guys came back to beat them ten to nine. That's correct. Aiden Court. shot first pitch to him a bowl. Of course, 99 with the Clemson series. Yeah. Super regional sent you guys to Omaha. That was about as much of Olsen Magic as you could possibly have there. At the right time. That's a call strike, so one and one to Hayden Shot. Shot walked in the second, flew out in the fourth, lined out in the sixth. Well, was it Dylan Rock with the big home run a few years ago? If I remember correctly in a regional. That was against TCU. Or super regional. Was that super regional or regional? But there's been some. Well, there was Olsen home. Magic in the 2022 Super Regional against Louisville. Uh, Troy Clonch drove home a game winner to walk off one of those. A two and two now to Hayden Shot. Of course, Byington going way back. 
Well, that, that seemed to be the birth of Olsen Magic right yeah. there, 1989, when John Byington walked off the Texas Longhorns twice on the same day. That's lifted to left. Under it is Aaron Downs. That's an out. One on, one out, bottom of the ninth, A&M chasing four. Might get a pinch hitter here for the Aggies. Hank Barr due up. Instead, it is Jet Johnston. Yeah, so we've seen two of the freshman coming in here. Saw Jack Bell going at second base to get an AB. Now we see Jet Johnston. Again, you're going to see one of these guys contribute. It's just a question of who steps up and does it. All of these are opportunities. And every time you get one, you really do have to capitalize on it. I watched Jason Tyner do that firsthand in his first college game, and he never came out of the lineup. And it's amazing. Some guys are ready for it. The lights come on, they get a big opportunity, they take advantage of it, and the rest is history. Jet Johnston quickly down to the count, 0 and 2 against Tyler Davis. That's the same thing I said about Jack Bell. You really just have to turn it loose. You really just have to turn it loose. The bigger the moment, the calmer you have to be, and just turn it loose. And Fall back on your training. Let the results happen as they do. Johnston stays alive with a foul ball the other way. That's a very aggressive swing, O2. Steps back in from the right side and looks out at the left-hander, Davis. Missed, a ball and two strikes. Ollie Camarillo is on deck. Camarillo, a multi-hit Aggie tonight. He has two of their five base knocks. Call strike three, got him looking. And A&M is down to their last out. Davis, that's his first strikeout in this relief appearance. Seven Ks for Mississippi State pitching tonight. And he starts off Ali Camarillo with a strike. Camarillo, RBI single in the second, also a single in the seventh. He was a fielder's choice in the fourth inning. So he's put two good swings on the ball tonight. But he quickly finds himself down in the count 0-2. So again, season low in hits for A&M this year is four. They only have five tonight. Too high on the 0-2. And the state pitchers have just dominated the fastball inside the zone all night long. That'll do it. He got him looking on the inside corner, and Taylor Davis, or excuse me, Tyler Davis, shuts it down for the Bulldogs and Mississippi State evens this series with a five to one
touch takes you higher in the symphony of style than a maestro weaving tales of elegance like a virtual show with that stage and fold baby stole a touch of class wherever you go Taylor on the beat with the fashion flow sewing dreams together watch it grow with scraps of suits they make it blow in the realm of style they run the show Life, they create a flair from runway dreams to everyday wear. Taylor on the mic, making fashion declare.